So, Mr. Business, this is your opportunity to address me. If there's anything on your mind you'd like to say before I pass sentence. No, there isn't. Okay. Um, very good. Well, then, <clears throat> when passing uh, sentence on cases like this, the court has to consider the factors set forth in State versus Galleon. So I have to consider the gravity of the offense, the character of the defendant, the need to protect the public, as well as other aggravating and mitigating circumstances, including rehabilitative needs and punishment and deterrence, and then craft a sentence in each case that's appropriate. <clears throat> in this case, when I consider um, the defendant's character, I can say that over the course of this case, I've learned a great deal about you, Mr. Business. Um, first of all, you were born in Chicago and lived there until you were about age 10, or 12 rather. Um, you seem to have had a stable childhood. Um, you were loved by your mother and your father and your brother. And unfortunately, your mother passed away when you were 12, your brother passed away from a ve in a vehicle accident, and your dad's incarcerated. Um, but I'm confident that all three of them probably still still love you very much. Um, her father's employment was transferred to Green Bay when she was about 12 years old, and hence began the contact Mr. Business had with, uh, with, with this community. She attended Bayport High School. Um, at about 16, she moved to Texas to live with her, with her grandmother, grandfather. Um, she graduated from high school in uh, Cotula, Texas, and eventually came back to Green Bay because she missed her, her father and her brother, which again doesn't surprise me any because, as I've indicated, I, I think they, they both love her very much. Um, she's worked in this community. I, I read over the, the, the pre-sentence investigation report that, that I ordered, and that outlines some, some work experience that she has, and I think that's a favorable character trait because, quite frankly, not everyone that lives in this community does work. And I think it indicates someone who, who wants to get out and support themselves and not make anybody else do it. Um, but that reflects on character. Um, she has a limited court record. Certainly we have pretty much the entire extent of her criminal record uh, in, front of, in front of us here today. Uh, but it's a limited record that reflects on character. Um, she's got a family who cares about her. And uh, although sometimes I think people take that for granted, if you sit in this courtroom long enough, you'll realize that you should never take your family for granted because so many people come in sitting in that chair in, a, in an orange jumpsuit and have absolutely no one who will come in and say, I'm with her. Um, and that takes a, little bit of, takes a little bit of fortitude to come in and do that. And frankly, today she's got extended family that comes in and does that for her because her direct family are unable to do that for various reasons. And so I think that speaks to Ms. Shabiznes' character because there's people in this world who find, who find value and, and worth in her that they're willing to come in and, and stand behind her. So I think that reflects on character. I'm cognizant of the fact that um, she began using drugs at a very young age, uh, marijuana at age 12, cocaine at around 18, and methamphetamine at around 18 as well. And we've heard a lot of testimony about drug usage. Um, and um, I don't have any doubt that that has an impact on how people conduct their lives and behave from moment to moment. But quite frankly, as far as this incident and these events go, I, I think I've spoken to this uh, already in prior hearings, but the fact of the matter is, um, when I watched the interview with law enforcement shortly after these events, I observed someone who was lucid, understanding what was going on, was tracking what was being asked of her, answers were tracking. Everything seemed to be together at that moment. Um, I, don't, I don't really see the influence of drugs now. It doesn't mean it's not there, but I, I didn't see it in, the, in that interview, which is the most, the most um, Closely, the most close proximity to the events of this uh, of this night that we have um, is that interview, and right then and there, she seemed to be um, very lucid in what she was doing. But I don't doubt. But there's a long history of drug use, serious drug use. Methamphetamine is a plague in this community, and um, it it seeped into this case as well, and. Um, it's something that we have to constantly fight against. 
Um, it's not a it's not a battle that that the system wins often, but but we're making some headway, and every little step we take is perhaps one life that can be saved as a result of that drug coming into this community. Uh, but it's a big problem, and it is in this case. I've heard about Ms. Eshabusiness's mental health history. I've read stacks and stacks of mental health records that have come in as recently as a few days ago, um, and I read them over, um, which allowed me to learn even more about Ms. Shabizness and about her character and who she is as a person. I've heard about her son who lives in Texas, um, and I'm absolutely convinced that she loves her son, um, and um, I'm going to say more about that in a minute, but uh, that's a piece of who she is because she's a mom, and I think that's a... That is a title that, um, that is a precious title and it's an important title. I'm also convinced that a person comes into this court uh, with their life up to, up to that point in time as a demonstration of their character. Uh, what kind of a person are they? Uh, what do they bring to the table as a member of the human community? Not just this community, but as a community, the, the human community as a whole. And um, there are some things about Ms. Shabusiness that, that uh, speak well of that. Um, I was a little bit uh, put off by a statement that I read in the pre-sentence investigation report, frankly, from, from uh, her father. Uh, he said on page 17 of that report, I feel like the system could have helped Taylor and kind of failed her as well. And I reflected on that because um, it's difficult to understand who people refer to when they say the system fails people. Um, because you know what? It's not the job of the system to raise people's children. The system tries to do that. The system is, is not perfect. Like our fight against methamphetamine is not perfect, but we carry the fight on. Um, people in our community uh, get into the system, be that the court system or the, or the, uh, the system dealing with child protection. Uh, really, I, I think what they're referring to, I, I don't know, but it seems to be the government. The government needs to come in and do more to take care of people who have gone astray. And I'm not sure that that's the case. Nonetheless, attempts are made. Um, attempts are being made in this courthouse every day, and to suggest that somehow it's the system that failed. It always surprises me a little bit when people come into court and they're coming in in an orange jumpsuit and, and, uh, and chains to suggest that it's the system that's failed my daughter. Um, there's a certain irony in that. There really is. Um, and, and, it, and it disturbed me when I read that piece. I'm not so sure it's really relevant to... to um, which had happened to Miss Business, but it was relevant to, to what I heard uh, from this witness here today um, because I, I think the system does the best it can. It's, it's imperfect, and, um, and it has all, very much to do with the amount of resources that, that the public wants to put into the system, and um, that's the, those resources are finite. But as I say, in this building, uh, the system is doing everything it can to fight drug use with all of our treatment courts, with everything we do, uh, to try to help push back the plague of, of drug use that's occurred and that we've heard so much about in this case. Um, so I, I, I read that statement. I, I heard from uh, Mr. Business's father. He is coming in here um, to, to talk about his daughter who's also going through the system, and I couldn't help but think of everything I heard about Mr. Business's son because it seems to be a cycle. It seems to be just a circle. It's coming around again so that if, if he ever finds himself in the situation that his mother finds himself in where she's the only one he's got left to come in and speak for him, um, again, I guess it's, it's the system that's done something, but... but um, it all starts, frankly, at, at uh, somebody's home and uh, what they have to offer to their children. Um, and, um, and so anyways, I reflect on that. But I'm also convinced that you know no one is responsible for, for where they come from. But you are responsible for where you're going. So there's a lot of tragedy that has occurred in Mr. Business's life. There really is. Um, I've already reflected on some of that. Um, and it almost seems as if you could you could apply the, the phrase, she never had a chance to miss your business. Um, and, um, but as I said, you're not responsible for, for where you come from, but you are responsible for the choices you make about where you're going. 
and um, and Mr. Business has, has got to be held responsible for that. And, and uh, this is the the ending of a process that is doing just that. At the same time, I'm absolutely convinced that um, you know, irrespective of the sentence that that uh, Mr. Shabiznis gets, which in light of these charges is going to be a life sentence, um, every human being has the ability to move forward and find meaning in their life, and Mr. Shabiznis has that opportunity, just like anybody else in this courtroom. She has the ability to do that, um, and um, I, I certainly hope that for her. Um, but all of those things I reflect on when I consider the character of this defendant. Next, I move on to the gravity of the offense. And I sit in this uh, chair often and I address situations where people have been, um, have lost their lives or people have been violated uh, terribly. Um, and, I, and I always indicate that really the offense, the offense in this case can't be overstated. Um, and that seems very appropriate to say that in most cases um, when there's been such a, a death or a violation. But in this case, it seems different. Um, in this case, you seem to run out of superlatives when describing what happened in this case. You, you really do. The list of superlatives don't seem to measure up to what you, what you see and what you, what you hear about um, and what we heard about in the trial. Um, this crime offends human decency, it offends human dignity, and it offends the human community. It really does. When someone loses their life needlessly, it's tragic. It, it really is. Um, it's tragic for family and friends and community. Um, when life is taken by a, uh, from a person in the fashion that it was in this case, where the victim's remains are, are cut up and packaged in containers, it's difficult to identify a human nature in those activities. It, it really is. Um, it's, it's very troubling. Um, it's difficult to recognize the general belonging that most people have for their community. It's difficult to recognize community in anything that, that happened in this case. Um, this is a small community that we live in, uh, where, the, uh, where the web of relationships almost you know, encompass everyone who lives, uh, who lives here, such that people look out for each other and, and uh, uh, care when something bad happens to, uh, to one of our members. Um, and in a broader sense, um, the community we exist in is the human community, as I've reflected on. And these actions are foreign to all of that, uh, to all that community. Um, and they shock the community be beyond the ability to adequately express in words. They, they really do. Um, and that's the gravity of this offense. That is the gravity of this offense. Uh, there, are, there aren't superlatives for it. There aren't really words for it. Um, you can get a sense of it. Uh, you can get a sense of it and a feel for it, but there's no really way to express the gravity of this offense. So the need to protect the public uh, is an important factor the court needs to, to struggle with as well. And in light of what I've just indicated, I think it's plain that there is a need to protect the public in this case. Um, as I said, this behavior seems so removed from the, from the uh, human community as to be unpredictable. It really is. Um, and in a place where, where this kind of a, where this kind of uh, an offense, kind of actions, kind of a crime is possible, uh, with no advanced warning signs, and uh, absolutely anything is possible then. Where this kind of a thing is, is possible, absolutely anything is possible. And from that, the public needs protection. They really do. Um, I, I've outlined, you know, what I think are aggravating circumstances in this case. There are mitigating circumstances, as I've said. There's there's things about Ms. Shabiznis regarding her, her upbringing and what brought her here, the struggles she's had with some mental health issues and, and struggling perhaps in the context of those issues with a family who wasn't always as present as they could have been. Um, uh, those are mitigating uh, sets of circumstances. Um, but um, all of those things weigh into to what this court has to address. Um, and. Uh, so when I consider what, what uh, is an appropriate sentence first, I think the law requires that I at least um, look at um, at least some of these cases. I take a look at uh, probationary sentences. Those aren't appropriate. They would diminish the, the uh, severity of the offense. Um, but um, at this time, given all the factors that I have to consider, 
um, it's the decision of this court and the judgment of the law uh, that Ms. Shabiznes be, uh, be sentenced as follows. As to uh, in 22 CF uh, 363, count one, that's the first degree intentional homicide as a repeater. It's a class A felony. I'm going to impose uh, life imprisonment without the, without the possibility of extended supervision. I believe that's appropriate in light of the, the findings that I've already made. As far as uh, count two, uh, mutilation of a corpse as a repeater, a class F felony. I'm going to adopt the recommendation of the pre-sentence investigation writer. Um, 7.5 years of initial confinement followed by four years of extended supervision. That will be consecutive to count one. As far as um, count three, third degree sexual assault as a repeater, class G felony. Uh, I'm going to impose three years of uh, initial confinement followed by four years of extended supervision. That will be consecutive to uh, count two and uh, count one. As far as the revocation cases, I'm going to impose one year uh, of incarceration on each of those counts. Those will run concurrent uh, to the other offenses. I've reviewed, uh, as I've indicated, reviewed both of the pre-sentence investigation reports. There's certainly valuable things in them. Uh, I'm going to, as conditions of supervision, I'm going to require no contact with the victim's family, uh, I, I maintain absolute sobriety, a complete uh, SOT assessment and treatment follow-through, uh, obtain and maintain full-time employment, um, to the extent there's ever supervision, GPS monitoring. I'm going to require an AOD assessment and follow-through, psychological evaluation and follow-through. Uh, the recommendations that are contained in the pre-sentence for investigation report submitted by the defense um, indicates or suggests that there be services engaged in for substance abuse and other uh, mental health issues. That's a reasonable suggestion. Um, and I think I've encompassed it in the recommendations that I've made, which is there needs to be a compass evaluation and follow through with any uh, treatment recommendations that are proposed. But again, an AODA assessment and follow through and, and psychological evaluation so that Ms. Business can get the help that she needs um, while she uh, serves the sentence. I'm going to uh, order court costs. Uh, it's $538 per count. That's a total of $1,614. Uh, that'll be the order of the court. I do need to uh, indicate, as I'm required to at sentencing, um, that now that Ms. Shabizis is convicted of a felony, she'll lose her right to vote until it's given back to her by the governor or by state law, and she may not possess firearm or wear body armor. Um, any other record you'd like me to make, uh, Mr. Saunders? Uh, no. Mr. Freilich, any other record? Uh, Your Honor, the 581 days uh, credit for time served. Any objection to that? No, and uh, there's an additional 60 uh, days on the revocation case. No objection to that. 581 days credit on the, um, on the, uh, the first case, and then on the, on the revocation cases, 60 days credit. Um, and that'll be the order of the court. Then, Mr. Freilich, uh, you can go over your client's appeal rights with her. Yes, I will. And um, with that, then, this matter is now concluded. Thank you. Thank you.